good evening, good morning, good afternoon. It depends in which country you are now. Uh, our guest, Mark Wallet, is in Germany. You think he's in the jungle in Malaysia, but no, not in Philippines. Forget that. I'm now in uh, Almata. And Mark is an absolutely unique person, not only because he has blue eyes and uh, green background, not, not only because of that. Uh, his story for me... <laughs> As a film director, yeah, the, the, that is that is the true. Look, I'm in blue, you're in blue, and we didn't we didn't agree to the colors even. Um, Mark's story for me as a film producer and director is sounds absolutely uh, incredible, dramatic, but somehow this dramatic story happened to be very positive. He was a hostage in 2000, and maybe, Mark, you better tell this story yourself, what's happened in the year 2000. Well, thanks, first of all, Olga, for having me with you and to, uh, to everyone who's with us right now. So uh, to have a four and a half month story in a nutshell, and we can go deeper. Um, well, really, I was in a, in a, a dream holiday uh, in, on Malaysia, uh, diving. And from one moment to the other, um, suddenly I found myself uh, being hostage in the Philippine jungle of a small island, which I didn't know before, and in the mi middle of a guerrilla war. And that was together with uh, 20 other hostages, among them my parents as well. And yeah, so we lived through a lot of uh, unplanned and uh, crazy moments um, in the middle of the jungle and in a guerrilla Mark, war. why they kidnapped exactly you? Why there were 20 hostages? They uh, kidnapped you for money? They ki kidnapped you for weapon? What is the reason of kidnapping? Well, we didn't know. I mean, they, you know, they didn't prepare to kidnap exactly us. So, but they did prepare to come to this island. So they drove from the Philippines to Malaysia, 20 hours by boat and uh, kidnapped international tourists. That was the plan. And uh, then, you know, we were taken and without knowing what for um, until we understood, first of all, that it was a uh, a Muslim rebel group who is fighting in the southern Philippines for an independent um, Islamic state. So they are called the Abu Sayyaf rebels. And so this we understood that we are part of a religious uh, a war. And in the end, um, well, there was a lot of discussion <laughs> between also the, the kidnappers themselves. But in the end, it was about ransom money. And uh, that was perhaps for us lucky, uh, because that was able, that was a possible um, um, escape route from the jungle for us. You were very young, you were 27 years old when all that happened. And you spent uh, five months in the jungle and being kidnapped. What was uh, the biggest challenge for you? What was the most difficult? I, I can imagine, for me, I'm a drama girl. For me, even to hear that is, uh, I start trembling. It's really very frightening. But for you personally, what was the most difficult thing? The thing is, first of all, regarding your uh, assumption, um, who knows how you would have reacted? You know, there were other, say, girls or women um, who would have would never have expected to be, I think they are hidden heroes uh, uh, among those um, uh, around me. And one was a Lebanese French uh, woman um, that described herself as being uh, perhaps not fitted for the jungle experience. So she said she's a Madame Pompadour who likes to use a lot of makeup and stuff. And then she was in the middle of the jungle and she, you know, she really, really was so strong and helped lots of people, you know, uh, healing their wounds from shootings and uh, all these things, you know, really working with blood, walking through the mud, through the night, everything. So um, you would never know um, uh, how you react, but you find out in situations like this. And so for myself, um, the second question is like, 
how did I react? What was the most difficult? Well, one thing for me, two, two things. The one was the uncertainty. Because, I mean, psychologically, we didn't have an idea. How is this going to develop? How is this going to end? When is this going to end? And is it going to end in a good way? Or are we going to be killed in that uh, jungle? And where did you leave the, Mark, where did you live in these jungles? They give you a house or you live in the jungle among the grass? Well, we slept, uh, we arrived and were, let's say, disappointed. You know, 20 hours going by boat, then walking barefoot through the jungle for another 10 hours. And they always said, when we asked the kidnappers, where are we going? And they said, to, to our headquarter. And we hope for some sort of a facility, I don't know, water or electricity or something. There was nothing. There was just a simple uh, bamboo, you know, hut, a stilt hut. Um, so basically four stilts, a bamboo uh, platform and a small roof. So that was uh, really the headquarter. And this is normal in, in that region to live like this, but we were simply not uh, accustomed to that. So for us, that was difficult to be in the dark, have no water, have nothing to eat and to, well, to, to eat rice only and all these things. That was pretty demanding for us at that time. Uh, you were there, Mark, with your parents. You were not alone, and you uh, uh, you were uh, 27 years old. Is it easier in this difficult situation to be with your parent, uh, or it's even more difficult? Well, it you could say was more. Uh, it was easier, but for a very different reason. So. For me, my parents, that wasn't the support, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, institution that I used to have perhaps until I was, I don't know, 18 or something. It wasn't the parents helping me out. It was rather, and that was very helpful for me, I was taking care for especially my mother and at, at times also for my father. And that gave me a lot of strength because I was determined to, you know, everyone was determined to let nobody behind, to let nobody die in those circumstances and was very close to death, especially my mother who stopped breathing for a moment, who was, uh, you know, very close to death. And so that gave Sorry, me a did, lot of Why strength. did she stop breathing? Why did she stop breathing? Well, she, for, in the first place, she stopped drinking. She was in a kind of a coma state. So uh, we were uh, walking through the jungle. We had hardly anything to eat and to drink. And so she collapsed uh, like many others did after a while of marching, you know, through, through the jungle. We were on the run, basically. We were um, kind of attacked by the Philippine military. He was fighting with the uh, rebels. We had to run away. And so she collapsed. She was in a very bad state. She didn't wake up anymore. She didn't drink for a day. And then we tried to give her something to drink, you know, to kind of force her to, to at least to take some drips. And then she, you know, she was unaware. Uh, she, she, you know, got it in the wrong throat. She, she coughed and then she stopped breathing. And this was the most, if there's one moment which was most difficult, then this was the moment for myself. I can imagine. And what helped you uh, after this five months? You know, it's very strange. It's not five days. Five months, it's almost like a life. It's a very long period. Uh, what helped you to run away or you were exchanged and they gave money for you? How you get out of all that? Well, in the end, um, ransom money was paid. So one, uh, one hostage after the other was released, uh, which was a great relief for everyone. Uh, you know, me knowing my parents are out already. Um, and so I was among the last four uh, hostages from our group. And uh, so uh, I, I, I was very lucky in the end, I must say. And we had a lot of support. I'm still very, very thankful for so many people who, who worked for us, who prayed for us, who really wrote letters to us and everything. So I really, uh, that helped a lot, the support from so many people. And um, you mean also, you received these letters when you were a hostage or you received yes. these letters when you went out? Yes, 
we received even, I mean, not many letters, uh, many more people wrote letters, but we received some letters and some parcels also with food and everything. We were there for a long time. Everyone, you know, at least in Germany and other uh, countries, they followed our uh, kidnapping on a daily basis on television. And so some said, okay, we need to do something. And that was amazing. I mean, it was not about the food itself that we received. It was not about the items in the parcels. It was about the fact that people are actually, you know, caring for us. They are thinking about us, you know, what could we need in those circumstances? And that was very moving, the, the connection to feel we're not alone, we're not forgotten. I think these, in all types of situations worldwide, in war situations, which at the moment we, we have, um, this is something that people can do, yeah, uh, to, to support whomever, but to, to, to do something. It helps the people themselves because it gives them the feeling to do something uh, uh, sensible. It helps the people uh, who receive uh, parcels, which is very moving, but not just the content. It's really about the, the symbol that, that you care. That is very important to be, uh, to, there was like a connection. You were far away in the jungle, but somehow there was a bridge between you and normal life and you are not forgotten in a way yeah. that was giving you power to survive. Were you yes. afraid of these guerrillas, of these people, of these people who kidnapped you? Were they rude or how were they? Of course we were afraid. I mean, we were in the middle of a war. We were, uh, you know, they threatened if no, uh, if, if no ransom money is paid, they would behead us. So they would chop off our heads and they do this frequently. They did it while we were uh, abducted. Another group was actually killed, uh, another group of hostages. So we were very afraid. Yeah, but. Then again, it's like I never ever judge anyone by, by his passport because uh, it really what counts is what people do. And uh, so every one of the rebels was for us on the wrong side, that's for sure. But some were actually under those circumstances more or less, let's say, helpful yeah, to, to help us to get through those times. And um, so uh, they were very different. Uh, so I really thank for those who helped us and I, um, well, had a tough time with others who, who tried to kill us. Uh, Mark, uh, are you trying to forget about this time, being a hostage, being in the middle of the jungle? It's, uh, your mom is uh, not breathing. It sounds like very, very uh, frightening. Are you trying just to forget about that at all? Or on the contrary, you try to remember that, to think, oh, I'm strong, I can survive anything. Well, the thing is, I wouldn't be here if I wanted to forget. And I do the opposite. I, I don't even want to miss this experience anymore because I was lucky in the end. I, I survived, my parents survived, everyone from our group survived. And so what is uh, still there is a, a very big experience in terms of how how do people uh, cope with stress? H how do you, you know, can accept the situation to stay positive? You know, how can you do something to, to get through this, uh, these times? And this is what I'm sharing today. And this yes. is my passion this today. Is what you're sharing today. Now let's go, or let's uh, forget about the jungles because uh, <laughs> it sounds like, uh, you know, Indiana Jones movie. Uh, what you will recommend for people who are having stress, maybe they're in the war, maybe they're in the office and they're afraid that tomorrow they will be redundant because companies go going to, to bankrupt. Maybe I heard there are rumors in Europe there is no gas, maybe that soon there will be no bread, there will be no food. So uh, anyone is stressed to that level or another, uncertainty mm -hmm. or whatever. What you will recommend, recommend just not to go mad. You see, what I'm doing um, on a frequent basis is to share my experience, to, to take people to the jungle, basically. So I, we really walk into the jungle. I share a lot of pictures that I showed, uh, that I took during my uh, being hostage. And then I translate it into the situation of uh, the audience. And that really depends on where they're staying. Is it about Corona, uh, about the pandemic? Is it about, um, you know, fear from the ongoing uh, war in Europe? Is it about, you know, uh, changes in, in, in the company? Most and then, yes. It's about changes. I will, it's about uh, change. 
So okay, it's about changes that everything is changing and you adapting to this change, but then you receive the news and it's again changing. And in yeah. the evening, the next day, again changing. And then there is no power to change anymore. You know, I know the situation so well because I've been through that. I, I worked a long time also in, in, in businesses and large international businesses as a manager as well. So I know that situation and the same applies as for us in the jungle. The first step is you need to accept the situation as it is. It doesn't make sense to think about all, uh, to think about the good old times because they're over. So if there is a change like a, a company going to the stock exchange and now restructuring the whole company, then this decision is already taken. So you need to live with that. You need to look ahead um, and deal with those uh, uh, challenges. The second thing is you're likely to, you know, have very negative thoughts yeah, like, okay, if the company is restructuring or if there is changes, I'm, you know, I'm going to lose my job, then I'm going to lose my pay. I'm going to not be able to, to pay the mortgage of my house. I'm going to lose so, my family. Uh, Matt, Mark, blah, 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 even blah, blah, blah. though when you are in the jungle, you might think, oh, maybe I will be killed. Maybe I'm one of the yeah. hostage and they will uh, chop my head off, you know? Yes. Well, Not my very it. first situation, now take that, okay. My very first situation when we were threatened, you know, to when they said, okay, no ransom money is paid, we're going to behead you. My reaction was actually gallows humor, very black humor. I said, okay, Mark, don't lose your head now. That was my very initial reaction. So because I couldn't do anything, you know, and, and I think this is a reaction for people who are in existential situations where they, you know, losing your job, losing is like losing your partner, it's like losing your life for a moment. If you can't do anything and you can come up with some sort of black humor, it's good. Okay, it helps. It's like crying. It helps as well, by the way. It's a, just a strategy to relieve stress. It doesn't change the situation, but it changes your mental state, and that helps you to, to then take the challenges. So that was my initial reaction. But then, over a time, obviously, I could laugh away my situation. Yeah. But what helped is when we were in a very bad state, like being, you know, we were didn't have to drink, um, we were, you know, afraid to be shot or to be beheaded, then we focused in, We focused on what was positive. So we had a kind of a ritual among us hostages. We came together every night, you know, sat down in a circle, and then we thanked for whatever was positive during the day, no matter how hard the day was. And sometimes it was simply the fact that the sun Mark, was, was shining. It your idea? Was it your idea to do this no. round? No. no, that was my idea. And I was really, I was so amazed, you know, this was a, supposed to be a prayer, a sunset prayer. Like my fellow hostage uh, from South, uh, South Africa, Kali, he said, do, do you want to join a, a sunset prayer? And I said, like, good idea. And I thought we we're going to pray like, okay, God, please get us out of here. But he started by saying, okay, dear Lord, thank you for the sunshine. And that was very irritating. But I realized that if you really thank for a couple of things, can be small things like the sunshine, then you, you, you get into a better state. And that is a technique that you can apply as well, and that I do apply in my everyday life. You know, when something goes wrong, I do get in this negative circle of thoughts. Like, oh, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And then to remember, okay, now focus on whatever is positive during that day or next day. And that really helps. It's one of the techniques which is most powerful and very well proven scientifically as well. Are you still in touch with these hostages or you want to forget their names? No, neither nor. I mean, uh, it, it really depends. Very different meetings there. It's not only friendships. I mean, it's been a very tough time. We had conflicts as well. But there are friendships as well. And I'm, I still am in contact with some of them. And uh, yeah. it's interesting to see how lives go on or not. How did you solve conflicts there? Because you're a group and you cannot run away from each other and you're already under pressure of these guerrillas and you conflicts between each other. How did you solve the conflicts? Well, there was one event where 
uh, was simply by really putting it on the table and talking about it. So there were uh, two guys from uh, Finland, and one was uh, at the moment of time he was in a bad, very bad situation because people said he would always take more than the others. Like we didn't have much, but if there was something to eat, he would take more. If there was water to wash, he would take more. So. Then his companion, he said, okay, guys, let's talk about it. And he said, look, first of all, I want to know, uh, show you, he can't really speak English. That's a very tough to, situation. And he feels that he's excluded from the group. Now, I want you to realize that not everyone can deal with such a situation the same way, you know. Not everyone has the same technique. And some people, you know, they pray. Some people, they whatever, help others. Some people, they eat more. This is one way of, you know, comforting yourself. It's just one strategy from, from many others. And uh, so please, um, let's not think that everyone is the same. And this is where we developed a new norm in the group. You know, we went through this, you know, you know perfectly well that no performing team without team building and no team building without conflicts. We went through the storming phase and we were norming from that. You know, we were uh, really discovering that, okay, not everyone is the same. Not everyone needs and gets and gives the same to the group. But, you know, everyone, according to his possibilities and according to his needs, was the new norm in the group. And this very evening, when everyone felt, okay, this is not about being nice or mean or something. This is a matter of different ways of coping. You know, we had uh, the best team atmosphere during uh, those months that everyone, you know, came together, giving him a big hug and saying, sorry, I, I didn't see that. So this was uh, one of the best moments. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. These five, five months are very tragic, but they are so, I will say, educational because you can never study more about conflicts, about human yeah. human minds, about human brain, and about being friends, that staying five months away from people under the war. And that is uh, very, very intriguing. And it will be my honor, Mark, if you will be part of uh, one of our uh, events um, or maybe one of my movies. My next event is going to be 20th of October uh, in Dubai. And then there will be one event in uh, November in Kazakhstan. And uh, the event is called Women of the Future. But I think no women of the future cannot survive without men of the future. So if mm -hmm. somehow you will be interested, you have my contacts. Uh, uh, what we never know. Maybe you will plan to come to Dubai and it will be very interesting. I will be waiting thank for you. you. I'm very intrigued by your story. And thank you so much for being positive, for using this experience not to become angry, not to become sad, not to lose your hope. Because, you know, uh, for some people, they think that these difficult times, they think, oh my God, people behave like monkeys and we are animals. On, on the contrary, they come to the conclusion that humankind, human mind is not that big, but you using it in your way. And this way is giving me personally a lot of hope. And I hope to others as well. Thank you so much for being with us. And with these blue eyes in the green, you look very, very nice. I wish.